Welcome back. Uh, this is Tiffany and Andrea, and we are relatively unstable back again. And this time we have a guest with us. Um, we are uh, going to get the business part out of the way first because we're terrible at it. So like, follow, share. Uh, visit us on all streaming platforms. Holler, tell your friends, come see us. Um, we today, today is, uh, or I should say this month is June. It is uh, Black Music Month. Uh, Black people are celebrating Juneteenth this week and it is Pride Month. Yeah. So, <laughs> so with that, we have a super fun special guest with us, Corporal Danny Woods. All official. I don't even know what those ranks mean. <laughs> like, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds it like sounds good. Sounds really important. It sounds really official. Sounds better than Miss Langford or Jake's mom, as the kids call me. Um, uh, Danny is uh, an officer uh, with Detroit uh, Police Department. She was born and raised in Detroit in a huge family. <laughs> uh oh. Let's see. Um, we're, uh, we had a little technical glitch, but uh, Danny uh, joined the Detroit Police Department in 2000. 2000. 2000, and uh, has accomplished quite a bit in 20 years. Yeah, just, just a little bit. 20 years. <laughs> Go Googler. <laughs> Googler. X about uh, her. Right. Uh, <laughs> And specifically, the phenomenal work that you've done cultivating a relationship with the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community in Detroit. Um, why don't you give us a little bit more about you and your career? Okay, so, um, well, I guess I'll start at the beginning, not the four scores and seven <laughs> years ago beginning, but the DVD beginning. Um, uh graduated from the academy and I was the only person in my class to go to housing and I thought it was a setup because I'm like first of all why am I the only one and secondly what is a housing <laughs> and so at the time um we used to have a unit called housing and all the um public housing units within the city um uh, project right we would uh, patrol those. And so we didn't get your day-to-day -day patrol calls like you see uh, officers on the street. We kind of had to create our own work. And so um, being able to work with uh, several uh, field training officers, I was uh, pretty much uh, taught everything by the book and how everything should be done and just kind of develop my own hunting senses uh so that was fun for a few years and then the unit was disbanded and i worked at the ninth precinct um on the far east side of detroit where i was born and raised so it was really um it was fun non-stop action-packed because that precinct does not uh let you down when it comes <laughs> to uh action <laughs> i was born and raised over there it's really weird when you get to a house and you're like, hey, girl, <laughs> put your hands up against the wall real quick. So like, Sorry, you know, we're here for you. you but know. we're family. We're family. Yeah, but you, you know how it is. <laughs> Broke that out, you know, we got to handle that. Um, so did that and then uh, had a funny instance. It wasn't funny at the time, um, but kind of had a... a mouthy exchange with uh, a sergeant that I didn't know was a sergeant and uh, a couple days later he called back to the precinct and was like hey I like her she got a mouth on her she's got a mouth and so he came back again and he's like how old are you and I think I might have been maybe 19 on the cusp of 20. I got wow. a baby. Like yeah I was a little pup and he's like, I want you to work for me at Vice. And I'm like, what do they do? He's like, undercover, this, this, this. And I'm like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> what do they do? Yes, sign me up. 
And so I was very fortunate to go to Vice and learn a lot, do a lot. And again, that unit was disbanded. And I don't want it to seem like everywhere I go gets disbanded because it's not me. It's not me, I promise. It's not me. But um, it got disbanded. And then I worked at Narcotics and back to the precinct. And um, the culture had changed a little bit at the precinct because you had the old timers that were just so disgruntled with the contract and the pay and, you know, with crime increasing and, you know, you're underpaid and overworked. Then you've got the new kids coming out of the academy and they want to save the world. But then you've got this grumpy officer sucking the <laughs> life and the fun out of you. And so it kind of make, you know, it waters down your, um, excitement and wanting to be the police and so then I started noticing bad habits and incomplete paperwork and I'm very structured and very specific and meticulous about paperwork That's the Aquarius and so I'm in like you. maybe I need to be a field training officer so I can teach you the right way you develop your own bad habits no I'm joking but <laughs> I want to teach you the right way how to do things so I did that for a few years Sorry. Um, but did that for a while and have trained people that have went on to become lieutenants, sergeants, captains, commanders. Like, it's really awesome, you know, when walking in the hallway and you see a commander that you train and it's Aww. like, you get that, you know? And they're like, why haven't you gotten promoted? No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I right. like where I am right here and this right here, I'm good. Um, so did that and then fast forward maybe to about 2006 my partner and I were heading to a police run and it was a domestic violence um, run and when we got there it was two females the only thing they were missing was a referee and a ring because they were going at it on the front lawn but when we pulled up my partner says to me and this wasn't even my regular partner he goes I wonder which one is the man and so that kind of struck a nerve with me. And I was like, wow, really? That's how you feel? So there was some exchange, but we had to address the issue. And afterwards, I went to the precinct, and um, the commander at the time was still kind of apprehensive about addressing it. And although we had community relations, there was no one specific for the LGBT community. And so, you know, I kind of hinted around at that, but it was still very taboo at the time. So um, it kind of just went on a back burner. And so years passed, years passed. And then in 2011, that same commander became chief. Well, he was chief before that, but in the year 2011, he gives me a call. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> Very strange for the chief to be calling me. But we were good, we were good buddies as well. But um he's like, hey, I just came from this awesome training in Atlanta and um they have this LGBT liaison position and I think that you will be good for that. I said, Oh, you think <laughs> that I that Pause, pause. You know, from a conversation, we boom. Okay. And so, um, you know, I accepted the challenge, but at the time, neither one of us knew where to go, what to do with it. But he's like, you'll figure it out. And within that time, I really hadn't done much only because I was connected to the community as far as the circles that I hung around in. And if anyone had a question or anything, you know, I had no problem answering, but still it, um, sorry, it's really in my eye. Okay. You're good. Um, You're, we're relatively unstable. Anything goes. <laughs> Anything goes. But, um, you know, I just kind of had to find my way. And um, in 2013, when Chief Craig um, became the chief, one of his first orders of business was ensuring that the department had an LGBT liaison. And so 
with that, you know, he tasked me with reaching out to the other cities where he worked, where there was a liaison and and talking with those officers, all they could tell me about was pride. And I'm like, that's wonderful, but what happens July through May? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, we just kind of prepare for pride and, you know, we do this and that. And I'm like, okay, that is real. So they get small. to march. They yeah, get to march in the parade. That's yeah. That's nothing. You know, I mean, right. that's something, but I mean, there's ha there has to be more to it. And so what I did was attended quite a few community meetings and just kind of went out into the community and asked them, what do you want from your police department? What do you think that you need? You know, how can we better service you? And so um, the feedback was great. And most of them were just concerned with the interaction. Like, you know, people don't know how to talk to me. If they talk to me at all, you know, mostly they ignore me. And, you know, just being a marginalized community, law enforcement did not know how to interact with that specific community. And so I partnered with Equality Michigan and um, we did a training together. And the concept was, you say it in our language, I'll interpret it to my blue family in our language. And that was the worst training, the worst. <laughs> it was bad, only because the organization, well, the presenters from the organization were very um, biased in their own feelings in regard to uh, people that just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And so it was more so you need to do this and you need to do that. And say it coming at people, adults, you know, alpha type people, you know, with that kind of uh, attitude and vigor, you're, they're going to put up the defensive wall. And so what wound up happening was <laughs> I almost had to referee that thing. And I'm like, wow, okay. So maybe I'll create one and see how this goes. And so I did some research and, you know, after a couple of weeks, put some things together and I submitted it to um, our statewide training and they approved it, which was really awesome. And so um, Detroit has the only certified uh, LGBT sensitivity, diversity and cu cultural competency training when it comes to LGBTQ uh, sensitivity. So we have the only one that's certified. And so it makes it easier for law enforcement to talk to law enforcement and answer all the questions and give them the scenario so that they can better understand and grasp the culture and history and understand that it's not about preferential treatment. You know, we're talking about equality you know, and understanding the, the who, what, where, when, why, and how, you know, that there's a reason behind, you know, a lot of this stuff. So uh, besides training um, and interacting with uh, community members as far as, you know, e meetings, events, panels, whatever that is, and then also um, being that ear and shoulder, you know, if something happens, if a community member is victimized, or even if they're a, a suspect or an offender, you know, they may not be uh, so keen on talking to the detective or investigator, but if I'm there, then they're like, okay, I know I'm safe, I have some support. And so I kind of play that role as well. So that that's it kind of in a nutshell. That's a, 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 that's a, a busy existence. <laughs> that's, a, that's a full, that's a, I'm like, what have I done today? <laughs> <laughs> well, not, that's not, <laughs> right, not much. Um, so, first of all, the the amount of trust that that your leadership had in you that has to be um, quite validating. You know, I think of what's going on now, and and people who are doing so much work in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, and, and that is a huge challenge that you 
um, navigated um, it seemingly fairly easily. It, it's a, it was a long journey, but mm -hmm. you were able to kind of make it past that hurdle. Um, so that had to have kind of helped you know, just clear your mind. Like, I think it's, it's it can be, um, you know, uh, just emotionally or psychologically hindering when you don't have that kind of trust from your leadership to be able to go forth and, and, and be able to take a risk. And yeah, it's, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was gonna say, it's very, um, it's challenging all the time. You know, there's never a dull moment. Um, but having the support from my partners and the department definitely makes it easier. However, um, building this relationship with the community when there was not one was very, uh, it, it, was, it was beyond challenging, honestly. Um, you know, people that know me are like, yeah, you're cool. We know you, but not all of y'all, you know what I mean? And so the police are then homogenized because it's not this that they're upset with, it's the, you know, it's this, well, not this, sure, but you know, it's, it's the uniform that they're mad at. And so to be able to knock down those walls and break down those barriers, it has definitely uh, catapulted the uh, relationship and interaction with, uh, the LGBT community here specifically and law enforcement to the point where we have become the blueprint, you know, for other cities and uh, departments to create a position or even entertain the idea of interacting with their community so that they can build as well. So yeah, it definitely uh, has its rewards, but it's, it's an uphill battle. Do you, ha are you a one, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Andrea. Oh, I just wanted to ask, because I know that there's been, you know, with the George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, so like we all know about those and they are definitely getting shine on social media as far as like donations to the funds to help, you know, mm -hmm. support those causes. But the Black Trans Lives Matter, Mm -hmm. hashtag has been gathering speed or you know momentum but still not not nearly as enough as just the the overall black lives matter which i mean i guess you can include that in the black lives matter but speaking specifically about trans people mm -hmm. so and i got to thinking about that and like we hear a lot of the trans community being like targeted like mm -hmm. particularly in the south i guess mm -hmm. and so then i just googled i was like well i haven't heard of any violence towards trans women or men in detroit but obviously there has been yeah and, right and yeah. so that kind of makes me wonder like like why and i know that this i mean you're not like a media person but like just the overall point is that we don't really hear about these people that are the victims of violence, like it's like every once in a while we'll get a uh, say her name and then a hashtag of her name, you know, but like there's women and men here that are suffering violence because they're trans and like mm -hmm. how, how have you had to, I guess, ad adjust your strategy and training towards that and like cops being sensitive, even if they're not well, when they are a victim of violence, but they're alive and they haven't been killed, but like, how do they, you know, not misgender somebody and like treat them, you know, with respect based on how they present themselves and maybe not necessarily their birth gender, but how they want to be treated. Like, how do you like handle the training with that part? And have you had a lot of resistance? Okay, so in the training, that definitely is uh, encompassed in there. Um, we go through terminology and orientation and identity and expression. We talk about all those things so that it's a, it's a preventative measure. We don't have to be reactive. We're proactive 
and interacting with our community. Also, we have a large uh, trans uh, outreach and advocacy here in Detroit. Um, and it stemmed from, which was actually interesting, uh, I was planning my first LGBT community chat, and I believe it was in 2014. That was the first one. Um, and maybe a week before we were supposed to have it, literally, no, I'll say two weeks, there was like this crazy spike in violence against trans women. And of course, when we have the chat, the community is outraged and everybody shows up and they're like, what are the police doing to keep us safe? What are the police doing so, you know, uh, we don't get hurt? Are they investigating our cases? Are they just uh, laying by the wayside? And so we took all of that, you know, because we give every case the same amount of respect and the same amount of uh, investigation everything you know is treated the same we just want to really catch the bad guy get him off the street and bring this person justice whomever it is um but stemming from the chat you know all of their concerns and complaints we took them all to back to the drawing board and their birth the lgbt advisory board and it was made up of you know every letter in the alphabet including allies you know from every spectrum of of race gender identity like it was a great group of people that came together and really really um pulled from their own resources brought them to the table so that we could create a better and more um I keep saying this word, but interactive community because it we all have to live here, live here, work here, you know, kids play here. And so with that, um, it helped to create even more advocates and activists for the um, trans community and the LGBT community as a whole, but so many, so many to the point where we are all, um, you know, we can interact with the attorney general, with the governor, you know, the mayor, we have the ear of the highest ranking people in our city, you know, so when things happen, you know, they don't just go unnoticed, they're handled. And so to answer your question, um, we get right on it and we tackle it, you know, and if there's a situation where it's like, okay, something happened. The community shuts down because it might be within the community and they don't want to deal with the police, but you kind of have to. And so mom is the word in the community. But then we're like, so how do you expect to get any kind of justice if you shut down on us? We have to work together. And that became the uh, foundation and platform. We have to work together. And finally, I guess it um, translated for both the detectives and community members like, okay, if we don't talk to them, we won't get anywhere. If they don't talk to us, we won't get anywhere. And so we just created a space and it's been working. It's been working. You know, when you give people a seat at the table or just listen to their voice, you know what I mean? Because everybody has something to say. And sometimes, you know, it, it's beneficial and sometimes it's just talk. But when you're talking about something of this caliber and uh, this sensitive and uh, this necessary, you have to work together. And that's what uh, we've been doing here. Now, I'm not claiming perfection. <laughs> not at all. But we have um, a blueprint. And it works for us. You don't have to be uh, perfect to achieve progress. So, you know. That's true. Thank yeah. you. We're, we're, all of us are imperfect people. So, like, we're not, we're not going to get it 100% right all the time. And we're not going to, you know, make the right decisions or use the best judgment sometimes or 
or we use the best judgment based on information that we have at the time, like whatever, like, yeah, like we're just, we're all learning and all just trying to do the best we can. Every right. day as we go along. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, when I talked to you before, Danny, I, I told you how I was kind of um, moved by a, a comment that Billy Porter made on his Instagram and and what he said and I'm paraphrasing was that the black community's relationship with the LGBTQ plus community is appalling mm -hmm. and uh, he said that it is eerily uh, resembling white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think um, is that your perspective and it, and and if so why do you think that is is this still is, is, are the same fears, you know, the stereotypical fears, particularly with black men, because he, he, he called out black men for being yeah. predators um, of this, of trans women. Um, is it still the fear um, of the unknown? What is it? So I think that, uh, first of all, it's a very true statement. We know that in our culture, even when things are wrong, you know, you may have the um, uncle or aunt that is, um, you know, they may be a sexual deviant or something. And it's like, everybody know, but we don't talk about it. You know, it, it's things in the, you know, this one's got a habit, you know, when we had a barbecue, you just keep him outside. He can come, but he can't come in. Don't mm -hmm. leave your purse. You know, like all of these things and we never address it. And so now we're in the, uh, climate of expression, you know, because nobody's taking nothing now. It's like, hey, I'm in my feelings about that, and I need to talk about it. And so, um, but specifically in the Black community, as it pertains to Black men, um, you're looked at as less than if you're gay. You're not looked at as, you know, a strong Black man. Why can't I be a strong Black man and just love who I love? But for some odd reason, there's this perception that if you are gay, you are weaker, you're less than, you know, you'll, you're not tough, you know, because God forbid a man has feelings, you know, oh my God, he's soft and he's a punk or however you people phrase it. Um, but that's number one. And then if you take it a step further um, and you talk about, you know, trans uh, women, men that are uh, down low, right? You see it in movies, you know, even in the movie uh, for colored girls. Do you, I don't know if you've seen it or, but there was a scene where Omari Hardwick and Janet Jackson, she was confronting him because she had contracted, I can't remember, uh, I think she contracted AIDS and it was from him. And she asked him if he was gay and he said, no, I'm not gay. I'm just a man who enjoys sex with another man. But I can't be who I want to be. But who do you want to be? You know, mm -hmm. because you have to keep up this facade. Even on the department, there are men that are of the community. But because of the hazing that still happens or, you know, the water cooler talk, you know, they're still in their closet while at work. Um, and it's, it's difficult for uh, black men, well, men in general, but specifically it's difficult for black men because of the stereotypes, you're just, you're less than if you identify as such and you don't have that same support, you know, in different spaces, you, you still can't be who you wanna be, you know, if you work in a factory, you know, it's like, oh no, and definitely if you, you can't talk to the gay guy because, you know, some gay might get on you. I don't know if it's contagious or not. You know, like it's, it's so immature and childish to treat someone, again, less than because of who they are and who they love. And that's the same instance you deal with as a Black person. You don't like me because I'm Black. I'm right. less than, you know. Um, you know, I, I can't want and have the things that you have because for some odd reason, I'm not worthy. So it's, it's that it, it does definitely mirror that supremacy thing. Um, 
and it's sad and it's unfortunate. Um, but right now, you know, every TV show you turn on, there's a gay relationship, whether it's females or males, you know, and uh, trans women have definitely kicked down the door and, you know, they're in the spotlight as well. And so, you know, people that don't approve, you know, why do I have to watch this? Why do they have to use my bathroom? Why, why, why all of these things? But we put up with stuff from you too. You know, everybody has something. I don't like the fact that you smoke. I don't like the fact that you be your wife. I don't like the fact that you cry for your spouse, you know? Yeah. And right. it has nothing to do with me, but I don't like it, you right. know? But I'm not going to hate you for it. I just, hey, from a distance. And that's how <laughs> I operate, you know what I mean? I'll treat everyone with dignity and respect. It doesn't mean that I have to um, make your business my business, though. Right. Yeah. And like, so I get, I get into Facebook arguments quite a bit about, <laughs> um, it's amazing. Like two things, this gay agenda, like I'm oh, still, wow. I'm still waiting on my gay friends to like, give me the bullet points, get, send me over the PowerPoint so I can know like what, like what that entails, because people are so afraid of like, you know, particularly with black men, they think that there's this, because we're seeing them in, because we're seeing gays and lesbians in TV shows and all, and you know, and just being more out, being more in, living their truth, that somehow this is gonna be like, this is gonna turn them gay, or like this is the, the what's the what's the one I hear? Um, making, stripping the masculinity away from black men like that's mm. that's yeah, what I've heard I've heard that before especially in Hollywood it's like if you play a role where you have to dress as a woman mm -hmm. then they're stripping away and it's supposed to... yeah so okay. but like and this is the point that I want to make and this is my usual argument is that when we think of a man a respectable man someone that we look up to, we, we, we think of this person as being honest. We think of this person as being, you know, walking in their truth, uh, doing what they, like saying what they're gonna do and doing it. Mm -hmm. we, we think of somebody that's gonna be, um, you know, has integrity and like always chooses to do the right thing. So like, if we look at masculinity from that point of view, I don't know, too many men gay men that don't do that like do you right. know how brave it how brave you have to be to say like i'm a gay man that likes to dress in women's clothing or i like to be more flamboyant than mm -hmm. you know like that takes such bravery and strength mm -hmm. to just say like i know that when i go outside my door that people going to talk about me i'm going to get mm -hmm. looks I'm gonna get discriminated against. People might not serve me. People might not, mm -hmm. you know, talk to me. But like, I'm doing something that I want to do, and it's and that that to me is the highest form of bravery and masculinity and integrity and respect and all of that. So like, this idea that you have to be this masculine man, or that we only define it in one way, is just super like outdated and played and just flat out wrong to be honest yeah so when you talk about bravery though i have it's it's not a long story but it's just a short example and i'm just talking about bravery here um our first trans woman to join dpd is a black trans woman and before she joined she came to me maybe about two years prior to her um prior to her joining DPD. And in our conversation, and this was before her transition, she told me, I wanted to be the police my whole life. I wanted to be the police so bad that even as a gay man, I came down, I filled out my interest card and I signed up. I came down here in a shirt and tie, presenting as a straight man and 
it killed me. It killed me to do that. And I told her, it killed you because it wasn't your time yet. You had to live and walk in your truth to get over that hump in order to do what you wanted to do. And so she was so excited when she called me, Daddy, I signed up, girl, I'm coming, I'm being a police officer, you know, super excited. And when she graduated, I was there, you know, rooting her on, even in the academy, I'm like, girl, whatever you need, let me know. Because this has been a dream of her since a little kid, she's mm -hmm. wanted to be the police. And I told her, she was asking me all these questions. Is it gonna be hard? Is it gonna... I said, girl, compared to what you just did, this is gonna be a cakewalk, <laughs> you know? And in essence, it was because although, you know, people don't agree and don't understand, you hold your head up high and you keep it pushing because this is about you, it ain't about them. And this is your dream. Live your dream, walk in your dream, fulfill your dream, it's yours, you know? And so she did it and here she is and she's kicking butt. You know, she's been on, I think maybe three years now. And, um, <laughs> she's doing a heck of a job, a heck of a job. So I just me, wanted to mention that with bravery. That is, that is, that is, that is uh, the epitome of bravery. Um, yeah. You know, and you're going into a large organization that, you know, um, has kind of like this, you know, military structure, if you will, mm -hmm. where, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that, that's intimidating for me. Um, you know, so that, that is, most certainly bravery, but I wanted to ask you, um, so as we're speaking about this and then, um, and we're running out of time because, and I wanna switch gears a little bit after this question, but are, is the programming that you are doing and creating, is there any programming? So we, we talked about, Billy Porter was, uh, I think specifically responding to the incident in Minneapolis with Ayana Dior and, um, I don't know that I, I don't I don't know that we have that type of that that we've had that type of incident here, but is any of the program designed to kind of educate some of the younger community and 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 just so we're clear, we're not picking on black men. We're specifically we're talking about a specific circumstance, but is there are the, is there any program to educate the younger people in the community because this this happened these were younger guys. That, mm -hmm. that, you know, um, were involved in this incident. So, mm -hmm. um, so does any of your programming kind of lean toward addressing that type of education? Um, so when we talk about that kind of education, are we speaking on the treating people like humans? Yeah, like the community outreach, you know, and making, you know, so that, you know, what does your community outreach look like? And yes, treating people like humans, but keeping your hands to yourself. Like this is not, this is not your punching bag. This is not your opportunity to prove your masculinity in this moment with this woman. This is, you know. Um, so I, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that that kind of training starts at home. I think you're um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that kind of training starts at home. Um, but my training is more so um, geared towards the understanding of the community and the culture. Okay. Um, we do have several programs um, where you interact with police and it's community involvement with law enforcement. But... Um, nothing that uh uh you know you have team building and teamwork and things like that but nothing that, so no okay yeah i just i was just wondering if that if if that is a thing you know um given that he was you know when when billy porter spoke he was so impassioned and it, it kind of opened my eyes like oh okay this is yeah clearly but you know what <laughs> And again, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you teach your kids at home. You know, you keep your hands to yourself. You know, of course, if you feel threatened, you know, you defend yourself. But 
um, training you the way that you want to be. Hello, sir. Hey, I'm good. So you were saying that, um, you know, basically it comes down to home training and that's a whole other uh, show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about something that's um, more celebratory in your work, and that is Pride in Detroit. I've never had the opportunity to attend Pride in Detroit, but tell us mm -hmm. about some of the things that happen during the month and um, and maybe even just a little bit, a quick background. So we know that kind of Pride didn't start with Stonewall, or the Stonewall right. riots. It kind of just was a mechanism to move things forward and and is if my understanding is correct it kind of started as a celebration of the anniversary is that am i warm there you're you're warm there um but uh stonewall definitely um was the the catapult to get this thing going and um you know it was started by two trans women specifically a black trans woman, you know, and then a Latina trans woman, and then drag queens that joined in um, after being harassed by law enforcement. And even after that, you know, people didn't think anything was going to come of it. You know, they thought that was going to be the one and done incident, but it has continued, you know, years past, clearly. Um, so in Detroit, uh, usually June 1st, we have a pride flag raising uh, right in the heart of downtown. And this year, it, of course, it couldn't be, you know, uh, no one could really attend because of COVID. Um, but we still raise the flag. And it's, it's there through the whole month of pride, through the whole month of June. And normally there's a huge festival in Detroit and then the surrounding the surrounding uh, Detroit city. Well, really, no, all throughout Michigan, there's pride, you know, going, well, everywhere, but um, it's a big festival throughout the weekend. And then um, we actually have another celebration in July called Hotter Than July. And that's like Detroit's gay black pride. And I didn't mean to do air quotes. Uh, <laughs> Detroit's Gay Black Pride, which is actually the second largest gay black, black pride in the nation. Wow. Um, and it's been going, I think they're in their 25th or 26th year of doing it. Um, and this year, sadly, it's going to be virtual, you know, uh, but normally that's a week long event, event with uh, different things happening every day. Um, it starts out with the candlelight vigil, then they have an opening party with um, resources and everything, kind of like a job fair in the beginning, and then it turns to a big party. Um, we have uh, movie screenings from gay uh, film directors and producers. It's really awesome. And then a uh, prayer breakfast, a picnic, a ball, like it's a big, big, big to do. But this year it's it's virtual so how um, are you gonna kind of engage virtually you know so that you don't have a whole year loss of you know such an important celebration well i think um just being supportive of the events in and of itself you know and um definitely engaging with other community members you celebrate the best you can and that's kind of all we have right now is the virtual thing. So I think just supporting um, whatever online parties or discussions or whatever things are being um, presented as community members, just participating, being visible in all of those spaces. Excellent. Um, Danny, we could probably talk for another hour. Um, <laughs> but I want to be respectful of both of your time. Where can uh, we find out more about uh, your program and your engagement in the community? Do you um, have a social media handle that you want to share? I do. So it is, it's kind of long, but it's Detroit Police Department, LGBTQ liaison. And you'll see my picture. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know you got the right page. <laughs> you can check that out. Um, and I try and post, you know, upcoming events or even things that are just going on communally that I may not directly be in, um, you know, the host of or participating in, but just promoting other people's stuff so that we can spread the word and whatever's going on. So definitely follow me, follow me, follow me. Excellent. <laughs> um danny thank you for showing up for us I, and letting us go on your look it looks like we were on a ride along <laughs> right <laughs> like this is the Absolutely. closest i'm gonna get to police work <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> right, i can deputize you, babe. you <laughs> and you'll never hear the end of it from me either uh -oh. okay <laughs> So make sure you visit Danny, uh, check us out on YouTube, That's Instagram, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Danny. You're welcome. Absolutely. <laughs>